Well, welcome again. We're back with session 19 of our series of studies on spiritual gifts. And we have not only those of you watching by DVD, there are a group of students here in the studio who are along with me studying. We're glad everybody is taking part in this comprehensive study of spiritual gifts. In the last session, session 18, we talked about the spiritual gift of knowledge and basically said there are two forms of knowledge. One is known knowledge and one is unknown. And known knowledge is where God gives you a variety of experiences both in life as well as study of God's Word and creates a pool of information within you, in your brain, that at just the right moment it's needed, he pulls it out and uses it to make things clear. The other form of knowledge is where you have no possible way of knowing it based on study or living your life. God himself reveals something to you that no one could have known and you share it at that moment. Well, today we're going to move on with the spiritual gift of wisdom. I have been very fortunate over the years to have a group of four couples who have formed a small group in my church. Now, I've told you that my church is very big, very big. To feel a part of that church, you must get into a small group where you get to know people and they get to know you and you study the Bible together. Well, this group of people have been in my life for 15 years and we have walked together through life. I have gone to baptisms, I've gone to marriages. One of the people in our small group is a pastor. He's married most of the children in our small group. In fact, right before I came for these series of uh, lectures, he married my daughter. And it's just very gratifying to have these close friends who are there in the good times they were also there with me when my wife died, and they walked with me as things went on. Well, we have had a habit over the years of when somebody has an important decision to make, we have a breakfast together. And usually because men are men and women are women, if it's the men who one of them has a decision, then the guys get together for breakfast. If it's the women, then they get together for breakfast and talk about it. And of course, then I'm sure husbands and wives talk about it at home. So there was a time where I felt like I was not enjoying my job as school superintendent. It's a very hard job. It's like being the CEO of a big company. You have all these people and you are at the top of the pyramid. There's nobody else to say, okay, you make the decision. It's you who makes the decision. And of course, any decision that you make, half the people are angry. And so you're constantly criticized. You're constantly gossiped about. There's a lot of backstabbing where people try to be your friends, you think, but they're not really your friends. They stab you in the back when when something comes up that will benefit them. And I was thinking, you know, maybe I should just go for another job. Maybe I should try to find something else. And so I got together with the men to talk about this. And they gave me some advice, you know, have you been reading scripture on making decisions? Yeah, you know, I, I've been making this, spending time in God's word. Uh, have you been talking to your wife about this? Yeah, I've been talking to my wife. And they gave me lots of suggestions. And finally, one of them, the pastor who married my daughter, Frank said, Steve, I want to give you some advice. Don't run from something. Run to something. And it sounds like you're running from your job. You don't have anything you're running to. You're just running from. And I went, okay, guess I'm going to be superintendent for a while longer. 
God never called me to another job. Instead, he had another plan. My wife passed away a few months later, and God brought me on an adventure of teaching in countries in many different continents. Only God, who could have thought. But Frank, in that moment, was exercising the gift of, of wisdom. It was a very wise piece of advice. I mean, black and white. Let's look at what you're doing. Is it because you don't like it and you're running away? Or is it because you have an opportunity that's just so great, you have to run to it? Well, obviously, I was just running away from it. And it was at that moment that, like, the clouds parted and I was able to see, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And it's not the right thing. I've got to trust God to... He's got a purpose for this. So the gift of wisdom is a wonderful thing. And again, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it's listed there. And we're going to, uh, once again, see exactly where it is in context. We've gone back to the same passage before, but many of the things are listed in clusters here. So we'll go back to the passage we have looked at so many times, 1 Corinthians 12 beginning at verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. And then immediately after, he talks about knowledge. Often two gifts seem an awful lot alike. All right? Knowledge and wisdom are such gifts. How are they different? Does it kind of seem like the same thing. Well, they do have some similarities, but there's one thing that's different about it. Knowledge is where you share information. Wisdom is where you share practical advice. One is just simply telling a story, telling an illustration to help clarify truth, or sharing information God's revealed to you to make a point. Wisdom is where someone comes to you and says, I'm not sure what to do. Like when I went to my friends and I said, I don't know what I should do. Thinking about looking for another job. And then the message of wisdom was practical advice. So that's the difference between the two of them. Let's turn to one other passage, and that's in the book of James. And we are fortunate that there are several times in the New Testament where we have a whole chapter of discussion of a particular gift. Hebrews 11 talks about faith, not just that first verse, but the whole chapter. We are very fortunate that there's a whole book written on spiritual gifts, the book of James. And in James chapter 3, he talks about uh, wisdom and gives us an example of how wisdom applies. Let's start in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not have to come from heaven, but is earthly and spiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. And here's the part that's important. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace, raise a harvest of righteousness. He says there's two kinds of wisdom. There's wisdom that comes from the world. There's wisdom that comes from above. The wisdom that comes from the world may be good wisdom, but it may be wisdom that causes problems, 
divisions. It may be out of envy. It may be out of motivations that have nothing to do with helping the other person. But he says, you will always know that the wisdom from above first puts the other person's welfare above anything else, as Frank did when he shared that with me. He loved me and he wanted to make sure the wisdom that he shared was both pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. It was wisdom from pure motives. And that is the spiritual gift of wisdom. It isn't where you just kind of say, well, I think you should. Instead, it's wisdom where God working through you shares an opinion, shares a perspective that is biblical and one that is focused on the uh, seeking the greater good from the person seeking the wisdom. Well, let's take a look at uh, the definition that we're going to use for wisdom. It is to see and apply God's truth to a specific situation. To see and apply God's truth to a specific situation. It is the person who, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, confronts a situation, recognizes it, and then takes a biblical truth and applies it directly to that situation. And when someone uses the gift of wisdom again, it's always for the good of the other person. It's never for selfish reasons. Well, the meaning of wisdom could be thought of as mental excellence of the highest order. It is a person who uh, is wise and God uses that wisdom in a way that goes over and above human wisdom. Others have said it's supreme intelligence, such as belongs to God, broad and full intelligence, accurately and effectively applying the truths of God's word, and helping others apply spiritual truths to their own lives. Someone has said that wisdom is seeing the world from God's perspective. Wisdom is being able to have God's view of what's going on. Only the Spirit could provide that set of uh, understandings. Now I mentioned that James is a book full of wisdom. There is a book even greater and even longer on the book of on the wisdom and that is the Proverbs. And I find it ironic that God in His infinite wisdom chose for there to be 31 chapters of Proverbs. And there are many people around the world who for a solid month read one chapter of Proverbs a day. And of course in those months that aren't 31 days they have to double up. but. Most of the months are 31 days. And so they're constantly getting input of wisdom from above from the book of Proverbs. And I would encourage you that if you want to just saturate your mind with wisdom, then read through the Proverbs. And you might even go slowly. And when God speaks to you, there's some verse of Proverbs that moves your heart that jumps out off the page, then you should go ahead and stop. And maybe that's a good time to meditate on that verse and to apply it to your own life and allow God to speak to you. Well, what's the purpose of Proverbs in the body of Christ? It's to apply biblical truth to specific needs in the body. Applying biblical truth to specific needs in the body. And the role that it plays, once again, is a support gift. 
We've seen in chapter 12 that many of the support gifts are listed there. In fact, all of them are listed there. And as I mentioned, there are eight gifts that are only mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 and only one gift mentioned elsewhere, prophecy. So this is where the support gifts are mentioned. All right, we've talked about gift mix. What are the other uh, spiritual gifts that tend to have uh, wisdom come and cluster around it and support that gift? Well, again, often teaching. That does not happen to be my case. Sometime with discernment. And as we'll see, a person with discernment can look through a person's motivations and see if they're good or bad, true or false, right or wrong, pure or not. And of course, wisdom would be very helpful then. Encouragement often has wisdom come alongside. And encouragement is the person walking along someone who is in danger of wandering away from the faith. Maybe because of unanswered prayer, maybe because of uh, sin in their life. And it would make sense that the person who is helping that individual have wisdom to see from God's perspective, what's going on with this person and how could I help them? And then, as we've said so many times, the gift of leadership. Because the leader stands before the people and because it does per impact so many people, God often brings support gifts alongside. Now, although I've mentioned these gifts, as I've said previously, the gift of wisdom can come and support any of the other gifts, not just these. I turn to the commentaries, and I turn to a new commentator, Chuck Smith, and I wanted to understand what does he see about the gift of wisdom that might help me and you understand this gift a little better. And he writes, there is a definite and a distinct difference between the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the proper application of facts. So as we mentioned in a different format, knowledge accumulate facts. Wisdom apply them uh, to uh, certain situations. I've mentioned Matthew Henry before. He's an often qu quoted commentator because he did commentary on the entire Bible. And he says, the gift of knowledge is an understanding of the mysteries of the gospel, the ability to explain them. It is an exact understanding of the design, doctrines, and nature of the Christian religion. And here's my view. It can be used to answer arguments between believers. It can be used to solve problems facing the body of Christ. And it can be used to offer advice to those coming to you for counsel. I will tell you this. If you have the gift of wisdom, then you will find people naturally gravitate towards you and ask for advice. If that doesn't happen in your life, you do not have the gift of wisdom. Because people in their spirit sense when someone has the gift and that the spirit is speaking through them. So if nobody comes to you and asks for advice, not your gift. If they do, it doesn't mean that it is, but there's a good chance it might be. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Visual aid. I want you to think about a college diploma, something that many of the people in this classroom are hoping to get, and perhaps you are as well. Well, that represents 
a lot of hard work. It represents uh, gaining a lot of information. It represents exercising some wisdom in terms of what you do, what you don't do. But it isn't godly wisdom necessarily, it's worldly wisdom. It's secular knowledge, not spiritual knowledge. And then applying that to the world. When you get a college degree, you don't just get a degree to have the degree, to have information. You're going to practically use that information on your job. So it's like you're gaining wisdom here and applying it here. And the college degree is a wonderful thing. And it empowers people to do their job well, to help other people uh, gain a perspective of issues in their lives that they need to resolve. Let's turn to Acts chapter 6, verse 8 and through verse 10. And look at that in terms of uh, what is this gift of wisdom? Because there's no definition, we have to turn to Scripture to gain understanding through examples. The book of Acts is filled with examples. It is a uh, document that is a historical document of the early years of the church. And so it is chock full of different sorts of examples. All right, we've used this before. Let's go down to verse 6 and we'll see where this plays out with the gift of knowledge. Verse 8 to verse 10. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great works and miracles, uh, miraculous signs among them. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. This was uh, some Roman slaves who had come uh, together and formed a church. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. And the men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. So here's a situation where Stephen, who in the next chapter will be martyred by being stoned to death, he is arguing with these fellow Christians who have a different viewpoint and they're going back and forth and they just can't match his arguments. Why? Because Stephen's arguments are given through the spirit. And it's a spiritual gift that Stephen is exercising. Whereas the others from this uh, synagogue of the freedmen, they're using worldly wisdom. Spiritual wisdom always trumps worldly wisdom. If you have the gift of spiritual wisdom, people can't win arguments against you. Not because you want to win. It's because what you're saying in the argument is so powerful, there's no way to refute it. I have a personal example in my life. When my wife died in December of 2003, one of my close friends says, you know, someday you're going to be thinking about dating another woman and getting married. It was the worst thing he could have said. I don't want to be dating. I wanted my wife back. It wasn't going to be coming back. It took me a long time, three and a half years, before I was even willing to think about that idea. And of course, as friends sometimes do, a friend of mine matched me up with someone he thought would be a good match. Well, we met. It wasn't a good match. Nice person, no spark. But I did begin to meet with a number of women and each of them, nice woman, no spark. And I realized that part of it was because the thing I loved most about my wife was she was a godly woman. She was a Proverbs 31 kind of woman. And unknowingly, unconsciously, I was comparing these women with her. Not fair to them. They're different people. So I met at a coffee shop 
someone that I kind of know, knew from a relationship my wife had, and I had had through her work. And we got to talking and I started saying, there's a spark here. This is pretty interesting. One problem, she wasn't a Christian. Did that stop me? No. Finally, I find somebody. I'm interested in them. Again, I've been a Christian a long time. I know what the Bible says. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. A Christian should not marry a non-Christian. It's like darkness has nothing to do with light. You are in for a lot of pain and misery if you marry a non-Christian. And even though I am a Christian and I know that principle, I was so excited. I got this woman, I really kind of like her. So I'm oblivious to all of this. I sit down with a friend uh, named Roy over coffee. And I had asked Roy to be on the board of directors of my ministry. And Roy looked at me and I said, Roy, you haven't answered me on that question. And he said, yeah, I, I'm kind of confused and I'm a little worried. And I said, this is no big deal, Roy. You just come to some meetings and give some advice. He goes, yeah, but I don't want to be there when your world comes crashing in. Uh-oh. Suddenly, I get it. If I continue with this woman, there's problems ahead. Probably God's not going to bless my ministry. Maybe my whole life is going to start to unravel. I broke, broke off my relationship with this woman, even though it was painful. But I was very grateful for Roy that he exercised the gift of wisdom to say, Steve, this is not good, and that he shared it with me. I have some questions for you. Once again, apply them to your life. See if perhaps you can answer yes to one or more of them. Has God worked through you to, number one, apply biblical principles to other people's problems, issues, or conflicts? Number two, has God worked through you to provide sound biblical advice in situations where others are not sure what to do? Or number three, do you find that many of your Christian friends come to you for advice. If you can answer yes to one or more, perhaps you have the gift of wisdom. And if so, use it. Get out there and use it. Attach to the other gifts you might have and do it for God's glory. Please be with us in the next session as we study the gift of discernment.